All right, welcome to Computer Science E259 XML with Java. My name is David, and this is Lecture 9 XML Schema, second edition. And I intentionally waited today until we were actually recording tape, since it was snowing quite a bit today, and so many of you, many of you are not here. And so, oh, what a shame that today is, in fact, brownie day. So... <laughs> We have uh, three boxes of brownies to be shared among the few students who brave the weather. I'll go ahead and pass these around, but be sure, Steve, maybe, would you mind zooming in for just a moment? <laughs> they do look delicious. They do look delicious. All right, so well, let me pass these around. Feel free to help yourself and certainly break the seal. All right, with that said, um, what did we do last time? So a couple of weeks ago, we focused on DTD and XQuery. How about in a sentence? What was XQuery all about? XQuery. Sure. So it offers. Um, uh, I'd be careful about saying an SQ, a SQL-like syntax, but certainly a SQL spirit. The spirit of SQL is sort of the jargon, at least, I emphasized last time. But yeah, it's more of a uh, more powerful query language. It allows you to access multiple documents, and it also allows you to interject much more logic into your queries than, say, mere XPath, location paths allow you to do. This was just ratified a few months ago as in W3C recommendation, so I think it'll be interesting to watch over the next year or two just to what extent support is rolled out. But there's a whole bunch of implementations of XQuery, as you may have seen from one of the links on the website, but what you don't see it in just yet, for instance, is Zalin and Xerces and JAXP, the API itself. So those, I think, will be interesting developments to watch. But certainly, as you proceed with your own work outside of this class, just bear it in mind as a potential tool to use. Now that it's ratified, I'm sure the shelves of borders will be littered with even more books of this thickness about XQuery itself. So DTD is useful in the immediate uh, present since it has been around as long as XML has been. In fact, it was defined in the recommendation for XML itself and in a sentence. What's DTD all about? Perfect. So it's a language for declaring the rules of a document. It's sort of like a, a grammar of sorts, but not, it's not so much a grammar since XML itself has its own grammar, but it's a, um, it's a specification of exactly what tags might be valid, what children can be, uh, what elements can have which children, what attributes belong to which elements, and so forth. There are certainly limitations, but it's a wonderful, there's a quick and dirty language for actually specifying exactly what a document should look like, at least on the whole. Tonight and next week is all about XML schema, which pretty much does the same thing as DTD, but much better, if not uh, quite true to the spirit of XML, whereby uh, terseness is of minimal importance. It's an XML schema that you'll really see some verbosity or some verboseness, but it is a useful language um, as a result. And it also has a number of components, for instance, data typing and so forth, that allows, uh, that you actually see leaking into some of the other languages we've used um, already and some perhaps to come. So with that said, what I thought might be good, especially since we've had a couple weeks off, here's an XML document. Infer, just using your own intellect, exactly what this is a document for and how it's structured. And let me ask that with your brownies in hand, you take about two minutes just to sketch in the blank space here or off to the side a DTD for this document. And infer as much specificity as you can from the example alone. But go ahead and jot down the few, you know, a few lines up here that together define a DTD for this document and know that there's not necessarily one right answer. Steve, if not, I think we can probably fade out here for a minute or two. All right, and as you finish up, I made our PowerPoint editable here for a moment. Um, let me go ahead and propose just to a couple of the lines. Uh, what's an appropriate element to bite off first, would you say? A bookstore? OK, so how do we define this? So open bracket, bang, bang element. And then the element name is 
bookstore that we're doing, and now we have the so-called content model that comes next. What kind of content model would you propose for bookstore? Okay, book star. Book star. And that? No? Oh. What's the syntax? Is this right? Yes? No? All right, we'll come back to that. How about an inner element, something a little more interesting? How about element book? And then what might the content model for book be? This one might actually be a little easier. Ooh. I'm going to take those brownies back. Come on, what do we got for books? So children of books certainly include the obvious, title, author, date, ISBN. So recall that DTD allows us really just to enumerate these. So we can have title followed by author, followed by uh, date followed by ISBN followed by publisher. And in turn, we could define one of these elements as uh, bang element. And let's define title. We don't really have all that much to go on here, so what might we define the content model of for this thing? So not just star, but we could do PC data, which recall looked a little something like that. Now notice one of the takeaways here, we're going to come back to this example tonight in the domain of XML schema, but there's some interesting data types here or potentials for the data types, right? We have a year which clearly follows some prescribed format. It's probably four digits, at least for modern applications, and it might be constrained to some range or should be an ISBN moreover if we have this one two three four five six seven eight nine ten digit ISBN that too we might want to force to maintain some kind of structure maybe we want to ensure that it's one digit followed by a hyphen followed by these digits and so forth but ISBNs can be of different structures and still be ten digits um, sometimes you can have letters like an X in there as well so we want to be able potentially to allow for that so in DTD certainly the easiest way is to just say eh, it's PC data but that really imposes no real constraints on your data. So XML schema will allow us to be a little more expressive, but PC data might be appropriate for something like titles and authors and so forth. So we'll come back to this example tonight and we can fill in some of the blanks if you wish. But for now, let's forge ahead and take a look at exactly what this thing might do for us. And what we'll conclude with tonight as usual is an introduction to project four. So, Quick history, this is more anecdotal than it is fundamentally important, but know that around the time of XML's introduction, folks immediately realized, you know, DTD doesn't do everything, and it certainly wasn't intended to do everything, and so there were a number of proposals, a number of submissions to the W3C in the form of what are called notes, which are pretty much the lowest entry point to the whole recommendation process from a bunch of companies, um, a bunch of individuals, a bunch of groups, and so forth. And so over the years, XML schema finally came to what uh, was proposed as the recommendation in 2001. And then the second edition, which simply had some tweaks and such, was slightly more recently in October 2004. So it's relatively modern. Um, it, at least it came out a couple of years after XML itself, but support for it is pretty good these days. For instance, Xerces comes with native support for both DTD and XML schema, which we'll demonstrate tonight, which is a useful thing. It is one of the more verbose recommendations, if you can believe it. It's actually structured into three of these recommendations. So an FYI, if you're trying to look something up with regard to XML schema, there's not just one recommendation you would pull up on the W3C's website. It's separated into these three, whose names kind of suggest what kind of content you can find in each. Um, but example, so what is um, XML schema by example? So rather than jump into some of the formalities of it and the syntax and the models that it allows for, why don't we take a look at an example first? And this is specifically going to be a file called po.xml, which should be among your printouts for tonight, slightly toward the end of your stapled packet. Is it in here? Let's see. Roughly in the middle, po.xml. I'll go ahead and pull it up on the overhead as well. This is in our examples 9 directory. And here's our XML fragment. I don't have to worry about memorizing this thing right now, but just get a general impression. So the root element of this thing, just softball questions here, is what? 
purchase order. All right, that's got a ship to child, a bill to child, a comment child, an items child. So perhaps needless to say, this is a purchase order and contains all the sort of information that you might expect to be embedded in some record of a um, item that was purchased by someone or some number of items. So we seem to have an order that was placed by Robert Smith. It's destined for Alice Smith. Uh, the items that Robert purchased was a lawnmower, a baby mower, and maybe some other stuff down below. So sort of interesting about this document, though, is that a purchase order really sort of captures the idea of a lot of pieces of data that you might want to semantically tag in sort of a useful way. So separating street from city, from state, from zip. Zip, for instance, being something that comes in some prescribed form. So there we have this opportunity already for some form of data typing. And again, the goal tonight, to be clear, is going to be one, certainly to introduce XML schema. But the more interesting question is why? So again, last, uh, last time we had these limitations of DTD, and the goal then of XML schema is to allow you to express more specifically, more powerfully, exactly what you want your XML documents to look like. And one of the greatest reasons for wanting to do that in the first place is so that you, say the developer writing the application that just happens to use XML, can just make certain assumptions as to what is in the document. And you yourself are not doing constant data checking or data uh, uh, error checking to ensure that the data you're about to manipulate is in fact in an expected format. So it's a good question. What do you do if the data is invalid? One approach would be simply that your application rejects it. So with the design of an XML parser recall, at least one that uses the JAXP interface, is to trigger one of those parsing errors, fatal warning, fatal error, and so forth which suggests that you, the developer, could simply say, don't even let invalid data get to me. If you need to tolerate data coming to you in slightly you know, unexpected ways or incomplete ways, then you don't necessarily want to impose this validation process in the first place. I mean, I would say one of the other benefits, though, of having a language with which to express the format of an XML document is that really this is a language that allows us to specify in, say, a specification what some XML language is meant to look like. So you could, when you're writing your own software to actually manipulate some XML document, you wouldn't necessarily use the schema in, say, a programmatic way, but you could certainly use it during the development or the design of whatever it is you're writing, because it's a very precise and a very formal way of specifying, as we'll see, what the data is going to look like. So you can either use it as the human, you could use it as the computer, and there are actually other uses of it that we'll see actually when we come to web services where again these data types become a useful thing indeed. So even subsets of schema prove useful. Does it make it worse? Well, let me answer somewhat indirectly because realize too that an alternative to just um, rejecting invalid data in the first place would be to actually insert missing data. So that's one of the things that schema does allow us to do. It's one of the things DTD did allow us to do slightly as well. But I wouldn't push this as any sort of magical language that now is going to solve a whole range of problems. I mean, after all, it didn't even exist early on. And what I think it's one of these languages that you should certainly just take, take, for, uh, take it for what it's worth and where it might be useful, and acknowledging certainly that there will be reasons not to use it. Um, let's take a look then at exactly how we can express this document by way of XML schema. So notice up first a couple teasers of namespaces to come. So we have this mention of the XSI namespace, which apparently refers to that unique string, XML schema instance. Notice this unusual attribute, no namespace schema location. So for now, just know that that simply means, that attribute means, when it's in an XML document, for any of the nodes in this document, any of the elements really, that don't have a namespace prefix, like foo colon, assume that those are defined by the schema in that file. 
the no namespace schema location. So any of the nodes that are in the default namespace, as we've called it, just the lack thereof of a namespace specified. So with that said, let's go ahead and open po.xsd and just do a quick glance of exactly what is in this file, what kind of features we get from it. So up top, there's this notion of an annotation. This is like schema's version of a comment, but a comment that actually stays in the document and isn't an XML comment that might get thrown away, say, during parsing. So we seem to have the ability with schema, and this means XML schema document, right? This is just a common prefix used, like XSL colon is common, but it's by no means requisite. So this seems to be defining an element called purchase order, but of what type is it? So already here we see a different approach from DTD to actual typing, and we just explicitly say this is of type purchase order type. Well, that begs the question, what's a purchase order type? Well, let's ignore the next line for a moment and look here. And notice, and this here is where schema begins to get a bit verbose, but fortunately it also gets very readable because every line sort of tells you what to expect. So apparently this thing called purchase order type is a complex type, more on that in a bit, and that anything that is of this type has as its children some sequence. Well, what does this mean? Well, it's a sequence of the following elements. If you are of type, purchase order type, your children will be as follows in this particular sequence. A ship to element, a build to element, a comment element, and an items element, each of which in turn respectively is of type US address, US address, uh, un, oh, this is a reference to a comment, so we'll come back to that, and this is of type items. And notice already that there's these additional attributes that we'll begin to be able to use, like min occurs, which as the name kind of suggests, means that the minimum number of times this comment element or rather this comment element can occur is zero, or its maximum number of occurrences by default is one. So if you never see min occurs or max occurs, their default and assumed values are one, which is to say that we will, and we must have a ship to element, we must have a build to element, we must have an items element, but comment is optional, is the implication. Yeah? So if comment doesn't have a min occurs attribute, then have to have It would have to be there because it would be assumed to be one. Min would be one, max would be one. And if it is there, it has to be in that location. And it, if it is there, it must be in that location in that order. That's what's implied by a sequence. Also, an element that is of type purchase order type has this attribute called order date, and it's of type XSD date. And here's a case in which we're using one of the built-in or primitive data types that comes with schema. So we'll see later, there's a huge chart of 40 some odd built-in data types. We're well beyond the days of just int, long, double, short. We now have things like date and we have non-negative integer, things that are very expressive, unlike a lot of programming languages, but useful nonetheless. And this just means that the order date attribute is gonna be of a date type. All right, jumping back here, we had another element up here, a, com a comment, but this was a higher level comment. Well, this comment is of type XSD string. So actually, this guy here is referring to that comment. It allows us to really refer to the definition that came before. So we can reuse code, but don't dwell too much on that for just now. We'll focus on some of the more basics. Just scrolling down, let's sort of mentally recursively answer one or two other questions before formalizing some of this. We saw that ship to and build to were of types US address. So what's the US address? They too are of complex type. So take some assurance from this that this is perhaps as complicated as it's going to get. There are simple types as well. Uh, US address is the following sequence. It's an element called name, one called street, another called city, state, zip, in that order, because it's a sequence. And each of those are of these various types, whose meaning you can pretty much infer. This is an interesting one, though. It's decimal. So it's a zip code. So for some reason here, it's been defined to be a decimal number. But we'll see other numeric data types. And a US address also has a uh, country attribute of type name token. You've seen this before. DTD has this, so it's inherited from DTD, but it must be US in this case. So if that is to say, if we had PO.XML having an element of type US address and its country attribute were anything other than quote unquote US, that would be an invalid document is the implication. And I'll wave my hand at the rest for now and perhaps come back to it in a bit. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, good question. Uh, attribute is outside of this sequence. By nature, attributes should be defined out of any sort of sequence, um, but typically they would go down here at the bottom. The implication is that they're not part of the sequence because they're attributes. These are not, it's not a child. All of these are children. So that's all it means. And actually, let's do one other since it is here and it gets a little more interesting because it's so nested. Um, and then we'll stop because they get even scarier. But very readable nonetheless. So recall that one of the children of a, what was the element called? One of the children of a purchase order type element, or rather an element of type, purchase order type, was items. So items, in turn, is a complex type, and it contains the following crazy sequence. So what's this all about? Well, apparently, a element that is of type items is a sequence of item elements that can, take, can uh, occur zero times or any number of times. So again, we see both min occurs and also now max occurs and quote unquote unbounded means it's like star, can appear any number of times. It's a positive infinity. So what is an element of type item to look like? Well, you can also, and we'll formalize this later tonight as well, when you define types, you can give them a name like US address type, or you can define them anonymously, sort of inline, whereby you don't need a name to reference them if you're just going to define it right where you want to use it. So that is to say, an item is going to be of the following type. It's not of a name type, it's of the following type. And that's why complex type here is associated with no name. It's anonymous. So what does an item look like? Well appears to be a sequence of an element called product name, followed by an element called quantity. Well, what's a quantity? Well, a quantity, we'll see, is going to be a simple type. This too is anonymous, so it means we can't reuse this as we could US address type, but we're just using it in line. So it's a simple type. What, is it, what does that mean? Well, it looks like it's going to be based on the built-in primitive called positive integer, which is self-explanatory. It's a restriction, which means it's going to be a positive integer, but we're going to restrict it in some way. How are we going to restrict this type for quantity? Well, it's going to be have a max value exclusive of 100. So what this implies is that the quantity element will have some value as its child, its sole text node, and that's going to be, at the end of the day, a positive integer, but it can only be an integer between 1 and 99 inclusive. That's all. So verbose, but again, you can sort of read these things top to bottom and understand what they're saying. Follow, follow, uh, finally, after you have your quantity element, we well, have a US price, which is just a type decimal. You've got a comment, you've got a ship date, and then finally you've got this attribute called part number. And then we close all of the tags that we have opened. So it begins to get long, if not tedious, to actually write out, but you only write these things once. And frankly, they can also be auto-generated, as we'll see in the future. Okay, and now I'll wave my hands at the rest and come back just so we can tease some of these things apart. Yeah? It seems odd to me that purchase order um, is defined um, of purchase order type prior to purchase order preparation. Ah, good question, uh, or good comment. Uh, does order matter? No, is the short answer. So the nice thing about schema is that you can define elements and types anywhere you want, so long as they're defined in the same scope. That is, they're all at the same level in the document. That's fine. Because that is to say, if we define some type nested very deep in this document, it would only be valid, as you would sort of expect in a programming language, wherever it's scoped to. But because we're defining these all as children of the root element, they have sort of global scope. And so in that regard, the whole document gets parsed first, and then the schema processor figures out what is of what type, no matter where it is defined in the document. So it's convenient, certainly. And that was true, recall, DTD. The order in which we define those elements did not matter. Just by convention, certainly in class, I tried to do it from top to bottom, just because it read more clearly. Yeah? Just a general question. Um, I've, I've seen like, in corporate settings where they're using both schema and DTD. Mm -hmm. So schema, does it really does it replace DTD? In spirit, it does. And it does more than DTD. And everything you did with DTD, you can do with schema. But um, it really depends on your goal. 
right? We whipped up in theory that DTD for the bookstore document, you know, in a few seconds, at least, at least one of us did. Uh, we began to write it out really quickly, but it wasn't terribly expressive. It didn't take into account the notion of a year and an ISBN and so forth, but it certainly wasn't as rigorous as we might have been. So it really depends on what features, what problem, what features you're looking for, what problem you're trying to solve. Yes, exactly. When we define an attribute, that means that if an element of, is of type, purchase order type, it has an attribute called order date. That's all. Okay. So all, all you're essentially doing is adding, really adding data typing to data. attributes as well. Right. Yep, exactly. And we'll see, we can even factor out those data types as well. Any other questions? Okay, so just to summarize, takeaways, because we'll see them recurring now, what did we see in PO.XML? So the XML instance, the document itself, pointed to the schema, at least in this case. That is to say, there was an explicit mention in PO.XML of the schema document up top there. Not necessarily, it doesn't need to be the case, we'll see other mechanisms of associating a schema with an XML document, but this is one way. Uh, notice that the schema itself declares elements, it defines types, and that those types come in a whole bunch of varieties, among which are the built-in primitives, what we called simple types, and what we called complex types. And we'll tease each of those apart tonight. So, uh, why? Just to summarize, really to give you answers to the kinds of questions that you've been asking, why would you use schema? Or what might you use it for? So one, just data validation. It allows you to specify exactly what structure each element and or attribute should have in the document. If that's useful, this is a language that applies. It allows you to specify order using sequencing, which is something that DTD did in fact also allow us to do. It allows us to specify exactly what kinds of values are legitimate. We saw an example of requiring that US be the value of some attribute, so it allows you to do that. And it will also allow you to impose uniqueness, quite like we saw with DTD with the notion of a unique ID. Uh, it allows you to, now it gets a little um, sort of higher level than that, to establish a contract with trading partners. Well, it, that's simply a silly way of saying, when you're actually sort of trying to coordinate some data transfer between two parties, Alice and Bob, well, they've got to agree, presumably, on exactly what the data feed is going to look like. Schema is one way of expressing exactly what the data feed is going to look like. Contrast this with what you, uh, an alternative. Well, you could simply hand Bob a copy of PO.XML and say, here's what our purchase orders are generally going to look like, infer the structure from this document. It might be completely valid, but it's probably not fully precise, right? A human would have to infer what a date is, what a zip code is, and so forth. Schema just allows you to be more formal. That's the kind of language it is. Um, documentation as well. It allows you to specify exactly what some XML fragment or some XML document might need to look like. It allows you to insert the default values into documents if they're not already present. And it allows you to store some additional application-related information, annotations, comments, and so forth. So let's take a look at this other example now, just to tease apart a couple of additional capabilities. It's sort of more fun, or at least more engaging, I think, to try to learn some of the stuff by way of example, rather than looking at, say, the grammars or the spec for it itself. So it's a little low on the overhead, but suppose that this is our representative XML document now. So tuck that away in your mind. It's clearly for a product element. Well, let's go ahead and define now an XML schema for that XML fragment, or fragments like it. So this schema is going to begin, as did our XSD file, with XSD schema. The namespace we're going to be associating with it is that unique string. So any program that understands XML schema will be expecting that string to be our namespace specifier. Notice at the top level of this document, that is as a child of the root element, I am going to be specifying uh, the element called product to be of type product type. So that begs the question, what's a product type? Well, the only, the next thing in the document is definition of a product type. So how about from the audience, just in English, and you know, just descriptive English, what does an element that is of type, product type, supposed to look like? Okay, it's got a sequence of elements, a sequence of children, name, number, and size, the first of which is of type 
integer, the second of which is of type size type. What's a size type in s similar English? Sorry? Perfect. So it's an integer between 2 and 18, this time inclusive. So notice the use of min inclusive, max inclusive. Notice the fact that we're basing a size type on an existing built-in data type, namely XSD integer, but because we want to make it an integer, but rein in exactly what values are valid, we do XSD restriction. And we'll see a way to actually broaden what values are allowed as well. Not quite. So for now, know that there are three different t categories of types. One are the built-in or primitives, and those are any of these things that we've been prefixing with XSD colon. A simple type is actually, and we'll see this more formally, just a type that is um, based on one of those built-in types, but does not have children and does not have attributes. That's what it means to be simple. And a complex type is everything else. Okay. Uh, okay, so just to toss some of the nomenclature out there, although this is probably familiar from other languages, uh, when we define, when we actually specify what an element, an attribute looks like, they would typically say to declare the element or declare the attribute, and if you actually are writing the type for something or something called a model group, you would say you're defining the data type, but at the end of the day, those kinds of, that jargon doesn't really matter. But just to be clear with the third bullet, the order in schema. The order in the schema does not matter, so long as they're all within scope. There's this notion of global versus local components, which I alluded to earlier. So if something is global, that just means it appears at the top level of the schema document, that is, as a child of the root. Um, and the name, as you might expect, needs to be unique so that it actually can be distinguished from other elements and attributes. Local components are things that are scoped um, more deeply in the document, so to speak. So we've had those anonymous types, which we'll see more of tonight, that didn't have names, but they were also local in the sense that they were only valid within a certain context, within, that is, a certain open tag and close tag, um, which is exactly what that latter point is reminding you of. Um, just whipping through some of these before we get to some of the additional examples. Uh, the it is ultimately an XML schema ultimately is pretty much about the definition of elements and attributes. We did see some other things in there, right? We saw the notion of an annotation and such, but at the end of the day, when you're writing a schema, you're really defining what your elements look like and what your attributes look like. So with that said, um, you associate each of these things. Let's see, is it even necessary to dwell on this? I'll just wave my hand at this since this is just echoing the things we've sort of teased apart by way of example. But one thing that is worth noting, or pointing out at least in the second point, is that one of the things you can use uh, schema for is you can use an element of like name but in different contexts and give it different meanings. Because we have that ability to locally scope our definitions of types, that means we can have size as a child of a shirt element have some specific meaning, but we can also have an element called size that has a different meaning if it's a child of a hat element. So bear that in mind. So even though the names need to be unique, that depends on the locality that you're talking about. And here's now where we can tease apart some of the more um, novel terms. Yeah? So we have a uh, the Correct, correct. So if you were in your XML schema document defining an element that is called shirt, you could specify that inside of a shirt element is a child called size, and then using, say, an anonymous type, that is a restriction of a simple type integer, namely, you could actually specify what it's supposed to look like. And then in your other element declaration for the thing called hat, you could do the same syntax, but give a very different meaning to the uh, child called size. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. If, it, if you see the wrong kind of value in a certain context, it's simply going to be invalid. But really the takeaway or the point of that comment was to emphasize that you can use 
the, you can have different meanings for size in different contexts. And you would hope as much in something like an XML document. Even a while back, we saw that tiny little uh, mock-up of an XML document in lecture, which had a bunch of like widgets, I think, or items. And we had item nested inside of item, and they had different meaning. Based on context, schema allows you to express those kinds of things. DTD, by contrast, does not. If you define a size element with DTD, you're defining a size element with DTD to be one thing and one thing only. Okay, so a uh, more proper definition of these things. So just to recap, a simple type is an, uh, an element with simple type has character data content, optionally, but no child elements or attributes. A element with a complex type can have children and can have attributes. So just some snippets of these. These would all be instances of elements that are of simple type because they don't have children other than their character content, which is a single text node as a child, and they don't have attributes. By contrast, these, or this would be a, um, this would be a, what are we looking at here? Oh, these would be instances of complex types. So each of these is a separate XML fragment. This obviously is complex for what reason? The first one. It's got an attribute. This guy has children, right? It's got a text note and then it's got another element and then it's got some more text. This thing here obviously has children, um, but as you might expect, attributes are sort of by nature of simple type because attributes obviously can't have attributes themselves and we've long emphasized that attributes can't have children and that's why you know, that it's an interesting question at the start of a course like this when you say, well, do you make a datum an attribute or do you make it a child? Well, if you make it an attribute, that sort of buck stops there. There's no more um, potential for extensibility. Well, that's because an attribute of is of simple type. That's all. Named versus anonymous types. So this thing here, without reading the bulleted text, is this uh, element using a named or an anonymous type? Just to put more nomenclature out there. Yeah, so it's anonymous, right? If for the only reason being when we specify it's a simple type, we don't actually give it a name. Contrast this again with the printouts you have for PO.xsd when we are actually naming certain data types. So we had the, um, what was it, the purchase order type was a name type because we said XSD colon complex type space name equals quote unquote purchase order type. But here we're just saying XSD simple type but we're not giving it a name, which means we're sort of defining it in line, so to speak. And so what this means is that the element called size in English is going to look like what? It's an int between 2 and 18, inclusive. That's all. Other questions? No? OK. So simple naming versus anonymous types. Neat feature, neat feature, especially as documents get a bit more complicated and as we begin perhaps to use data types for things like web services, as we'll see in a couple of weeks, and we try to serialize actual Java objects and pieces of data from applications over the wire where we might actually want to preserve some kind of typing or hierarchies, well, schema does allow us to express the concept of a type definition hierarchy. That is to say that you can take one data type and extend it or restrict it. That is, you can base one data type on another. And we've certainly seen this because already in several examples, we've been restricting the range of integers, for instance, that we want to allow. And that alone suggests a sort of type hierarchy. We've been defining, we have built in the type called XSD integer, and then we've been defining effectively a subtype that is at the end of the day an integer, but it's only an integer between 2 and 18. So we've already seen this sort of idea of a hierarchy, but you can do more interesting things, much more reminiscent of something like Java, where you can actually specify a data type called address type, which has some basic building blocks, certain core fields that are always present, but then you can specify that a UK address is at the end of the day of type address type, but it has these additional fields. You know, special postal code formatting appropriate for the UK. But street address, you know, most countries have the notion of a street address, so that might be factored out into the base type, so to speak, speaking in the abstract here. Um, finally, and this is useful too, when it comes time for your schema processor to validate your document, well, just as in Java, the support for polymorphism allows you to have one object 
where another type is really expected, so long as there's a hierarchical relationship between them. Similarly, disk schema allow you to effectively put one data type where another is expected, so long as what's there is a descendant of what is expected. So again, that's a more uh, colloquial way of saying polymorphic behavior. All right, what are those built-in data types you should memorize? Um, you don't have to memorize these. I mean, the funny thing with schema is uh, you can just kind of imagine it, piece a bunch of words together, and it probably exists, like negative integer, non positive integer, unsigned long, unsigned int, but a good reference, and you can certainly find this elsewhere. But these are pretty much all of the built-in data types, and I've tried to categorize them into different classes. So, so related to strings are these data types. Notice the capitalized ones you've actually seen in DTD. Date related, you have a whole bunch of things like this, and I'll refer to, say, the one of the online references that we've linked to if you want to see the exact specification for these things. But it's certainly useful, right? Generally, when coding up you know, projects, it's generally useful to not reinvent wheels and to sort of borrow code off the shelf, which is to say if you're going to be transmitting data like dates in XML documents, maybe you might as well just adhere to whatever format already exists so that you have this interoperability. Number related, a whole bunch of them as well, and then things I couldn't quite put into categories. You have the notion of an NEURI, a Boolean notation, and one or more others. But the neat thing is that you can define new simple types just by restricting them according to facets. And we've seen facets already implicitly by way of that um, use of, say, min inclusive and max exclusive and so forth. Um, and then there is, I mean, sort of oddly, you don't see it as often perhaps, but similar to DTD where you could have those space separated values, similarly does schema allow you to do that where you can have a, uh, an element called foo and it can have a whole bunch of values in it as children, effectively as children, just separated by white space. But that imposes its own sort of nuisances sometimes because then you in code have to then parse that thing and explode the string into an array, for instance. What's a complex type? And this is where it gets a little fun. So a complex type, turns out, can be uh, of four different subtypes. A complex type can be simple. Or it can have element content, mixed content or empty content. More on that in a moment. But a, just to recap, a type is complex, or rather an element is of a complex type if it has attributes and or children. So what content models, to borrow our jargon from a few weeks ago, are allowed Simple content type, element content type, mixed, and empty. So what do each of these mean? We'll come back to each of those um, in due time. Um, but uh, foreshadow of some interesting features. We've seen this before in terms of the content models. Like what can the children uh, be, uh, in what sort of format can the children be defined? Well, they can be defined as a sequence. And we've seen this several times now, which means order is necessary. Sequence means if you see foobar baz, it must appear in the XML document as foobar baz. If, however, you specify all, they have to be there, but in any order. And that was sort of our answer to the very last bullet point from two weeks ago, which we had the big Ghostbuster sign that said you can't do this because it was a non-deterministic content model. Schema does allow you to require the presence of all elements that are specified, but in any order. Or you can actually have the notion of a choice, where you can say, eh, give me zero or more of this list of options. Schema allows you to express that as well. And we'll see examples thereof. So another example. Uh, in English, tell me a little something about what it means if an element is of type product type. What does an element of type product type look like? Yes, it's a sequence of children, the first of which is called number. So the first child's called number, and it's of type integer. Now it gets a little more interesting. So the second child are actually the second, third, and fourth children can be what? Yeah, a size and or color element. So this effectively, you can sort of think of XSD choices sort of affecting a loop. 
whereby if you ma manually specify that min occurs as zero and max occurs as three, what that essentially means is you can now loop through the options between zero and three times, inclusive, on each pass sort of saying that put a size element here, put a color element here, put another color element here, but that's it, because that would be max occurs three. So what that simply means is your XML document if it's going to be valid, and the element in question is of type product type, its first child's got to be called number of type integer, product number, and then its subsequent children can, can be called size and or color, and you can have a max of three of those. Now, don't worry about why you might want to do this. The syntax is more what's interesting right now. But what this effectively is saying is that for an element of type product type, you're specifying the product number, and then you're specifying the sizes and colors that it comes in but with some arbitrary restriction as to how many colors and sizes collectively can be defined. Is there any sequence associated with size and color implied there? Is there any sequence of size and color implied? No. So literally this is like a loop and on each pass you can pluck out either of these. The way that's defined right now is each one of each a size and a color up to three subsequent, right? Uh, Correct. So it literally is a loop where this is the list of options. It's not a sequence. It's a list of options. Right? If you wanted to have these things in pairs, if you wanted to have, if, if the implication were that you wanted size color, size color, size color, three of those, well, that would actually be a sequence with max occurs equals three. How can it be It just doesn't have to be there at all. So choice literally implies a choice of the following elements. Sequence means it literally implies the following sequence of elements. So really, if you want to think of this as a loop, it's sort of like an if, else, if you want a nested condition inside, where you can pick either of those on each iteration of the loop. And then you might guess XSD any just implies any element but any one element. Why any one element and not any number of elements? Perfect. So a useful thing to bear in mind, especially with schema, as with some other languages, what are the default values? Min occurs, max occurs, by default are always assumed to be one, which means this means any one element. But you've got to have some element there. And again, don't worry about the why for the context here. It's the syntax that we're getting at. No, oh, OK. Okay. Oh, and finally, we almost forgot the last tidbit. So this thing obviously has an attribute called fdate, effective date of type XSD date. That's all. Um, let's do this. Before break, let's finish off some of the formalization, and then we'll do after additional brownie break is come back to additional examples. So a word on namespaces. Um, you've seen these before. Hopefully you've gotten a little more comfortable with them because at the end of the day, they're not all that interesting, right? It's just unique strings that allow you to distinguish one language from another or uh, elements from different namespaces from another. Um, it's bound to a URI typically. It's just a unique string that the sort of world or the people have decided is what will define their namespace. Um, you can use multiple namespace prefixes as we've been doing in the class to identify elements and attributes from different namespaces or elements from different namespaces. So for instance, this little snippet here specifies that the element called product is in the namespace uh, associated with this prefix, which is specifically that namespace. Whatever that means, it doesn't matter for now, but we just know that we're associating these elements with that particular namespace, for what, whatever that means. And again, the prefix choice does not matter. You can be using foo in all of your XSL documents so long as you define the top of the document appropriately, but it's not as readable as, say, XSL colon. Uh, multiple namespaces, just to put these into context, here's an example of what appears to be an order that seems to have an order number associated with it, followed by a bunch of items. Well, it turns out that we are associating various elements in this document with different namespaces. Why might this be the case? Well, it just might be the case in the context of today's lecture that these elements are defined by way of different schemas. So we're sort of merging two different sets of definitions and intermingling them, or really you might spin it as we're reusing definitions that have already been defined. The notion of a product has been defined in one place and the notion of an order 
has been defined in another place. Because it seems quite reasonable that if you write this specification in a schema for the notion of a product, well, a product can exist independent of an actual order. But it does make sense for the notion of an order to sort of reference the notion of a product. And so that's just sort of a high level motivation for actually distinguishing two different namespaces in the same document. Uh, more than the number appears twice. Oh, and what worthy of note here is that this is a mechanism, moreover, that allows you to uh, define different meanings, give different meanings to like-named elements. And I think we did mention that back in our lecture on namespaces itself. So in here, there's two different notions of number. Number defined in the product namespace and then the notion of a number defined in a order namespace. Default namespace, just a word on this. If you don't specify, um, if you specify rather XML and S without a colon something, well that specifies the default namespace, which rather than putting it in quote, double quote, is putting it in that namespace, or the namespace identified by that unique string. But we can also specify a prefix to a different uh, namespace. So this fragment here is identical functionally to the one we just saw but we've omitted one of the namespaces. And you've been doing this, for instance, in a lot of your XSL and SVG work and XHTML work where you weren't saying XHTML colon H1. You were just saying H1. And that's because you had specified or we had specified in the files we gave you that the default namespace was going to be that for XHTML. So this is functionally equivalent to what you just saw. So really just a recap of those. Now target namespaces, and actually, let's, try, let's actually link now the idea of namespaces to schema and the actual association of schemas to instances of XML. So we saw something like, uh, no we didn't, we didn't see something like this just yet. So one of the ways that allows you effectively to specify what a schema is for, what its intended audience of elements and attributes is for, you can use this new attribute called target namespace. So what that effectively means is that all of the elements that are defined in this schema should be assumed to be in that namespace. Now notice why we need this mechanism. When you define an element, you're naming it by way of an attribute. But you don't specify name equals quote unquote and then foo colon element name. You just say the element name. So if you want to specify what namespace that element belongs in, when you use this mechanism for target namespace. So what you see here is sort of the flip side. We just, in those two slides, saw instances of XML. Now you're seeing the schema that we were assuming existed for those XML fragments and the means by which we define a schema for the notion of a product was to specify that all this stuff targets that namespace. And we did see that. So in short, this is an answer to the question of the form uh, what's the schema for the, P, for the product namespace? Yeah, question and then question. Sure, so what is the, and I'll, I'll go one step further and tease all three of these apart. What is the difference between the namespace implied by this, by this, and by this? So this, again, specifies what namespace all of the elements defined in this schema are going to belong to. So functionally, this namespace gets associated with this element, this element, and that's it. Not with this element, this element, this element. All right, so target namespace is an XML schema specific attribute that effectively specifies what namespace these elements belong to. So what does that mean? Well, suppose that I were writing a schema for the language called XSL. Well, I'd have a big document that targets the namespace for XSL, which is that long string that we've been pasting at the top of all of our XSL documents. I would have in my schema for defining the language called XSL element declarations for things like for each, value of, all those kinds of ele XSL elements, but we want all of those elements to belong to XSLT's namespace. So you would see things like name equals quote unquote for each, name equals quote unquote value of 
but those things need to belong to XSL's namespace. So in that schema, you would see a different URI here. You'd see the XSL one. So that functionally is what this guy is all about. What is this guy all about? This specifies the default namespace for any element in this document that doesn't have a prefix. This is not an element in the document. This is not an element in the document. An element in the document is anything that starts with open bracket, prefix, colon, name. So that's this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this, uh, well, these guys. That's it. But each of those guys I just enumerated has a prefix. So really, I don't see any uses of this default namespace. So functionally, it doesn't seem to be used unless it's ellipsed here. This guy, though, specifies what namespace all of the nodes, all of the elements that have that prefix belong to. In that case, it's pretty much everything you see. And that is useful because this prefix is mapped to this unique string. And anyone out there who's implemented a schema processor, namely Apache in the form of Xerxes, has hard-coded into their program uh, recognition for this string. And so if Xerxes sees that string associated with this prefix, it's going to assume that any element, and literally this element, this element, this element, this element, and so forth, that has that prefix has got to be processed as schema, just like an XSLT processor would process any element that starts with XSL, colon. So functionally, those are the three different roles. How then to relate schemas? Oh, sorry, yes. Is that the only way? That's the way to target a namespace. You can still tar you can still apply a schema to a document without that using different mechanisms, which we're about to get to. And in fact, why don't we, before we get here, since this is a nice segue to some additional examples and demonstrations, why don't we go ahead and take a five-minute brownie break? All right, so we're back. Before we dive into some additional examples, how do you relate these things to actual XML documents? So there are at least four ways to associate schemas with instances. And whenever I say instance, I just mean XML documents, essentially. So you can use a hint in the instance. And we saw this with our very first example tonight, where we explicitly mentioned po.xsd. You can do this even with XSL documents, and at least with IE6, and I'm guessing IE7, you can actually open an XML file with Internet Explorer, have a certain syntax at the top of the file that explicitly mentions foo.xsl, and at least IE6 would then read in foo.xsl and apply it to the style sheet and then render the XML file appropriately. So this, func this notion of relating uh, one language to another, one document to another has long existed. You can do it with schema, but you can also use a, let the application decide, and we'll see this um, by way of, uh, we'll see, you will see this um, in terms of uh, code, for instance, that we might write using Jack's P syntax. You can let the user use in the spirit of like XML Spy and Stylus. Both of those tools do support XML schema, so you can associate an XML document with the schema and say validate, and it will say yes or no, it's valid. Um, or you can even go so far as to actually follow the URI if it is in fact a valid URI and go find it, for instance, on say the web somewhere. Though that's typically not used since it's the, the programs know what these URIs denote. Um, without needing to read in a schema. So let's take a look at one, let's see, this <laughs> illustrative. Um, yeah, let's look at this one last example because it does specify um, a way of associating a certain file with a certain namespace identifier if you have multiple namespace identifiers. So just take this in. I don't think we'll end up using this functionally in any of the projects in the course, but know that here is an XML fragment and down here is another XML fragment. The means by which we're associating this fragment with a schema document is to specify that the schema location for this namespace, namespace is in that file. It's a weird sort of syntax using a space to separate the two, but such is XML. Down here, where we have a more interesting file, where we have a default namespace, and then we also have, let's just see here if we're borrowing any of these, order namespace. Doo -doo. 
Let's see, number, product. Oh, okay, because notice here in the second example, we're changing what the default namespace is so that we effectively do have two different namespaces in operation here, even though we're not using prefixes. If we want to tell the scheme, uh, if we want to tell the program reading this document, the parser, what to use for each of those namespaces, you can simply enumerate them like this. And notice we've just inserted a new line and a bunch of spaces. Again, strange syntax, but such is the way it works. For schema location, this namespace, pre this namespace will be validated with this document, and this namespace will be validated with this document. And I say this namespace, but that's sort of an abuse of the term. The nodes that are in the namespace identified with that unique string is what I really mean. Just know that this exists. It is not necessarily a manner in which you'll likely be validating your documents, at least for a while. Okay, what can you use to validate documents? Well, um, for online tinkering, especially as you play with Project 4, which does ask a couple of questions like, uh, give us a schema for this and for that, I'll be short ones. Um, there is this validator online, which is useful similarly as like the XHTML validator and CSS validators are online. Xerces, which you've been using for a while, has always supported validation. I'll show you how to turn it on in just a moment. Stylus Studio, XML Spy, and a bunch of other tools, certainly. Schema is pretty well supported. So if you want to use it, whatever tool you're already using for your uh, parsing probably does support it already. So let's go ahead, and in our code for tonight, there's one Java program, SACS Validator 2. The difference here is that whereas last week, SACS, or two weeks ago's SACS Validator only validated assuming DTD, this one allows you to choose via a command line argument whether to validate using DTD or using schema. So what essentially you're about to see is the lines of code that you can write when using JAXP to turn on schema validation. So this program, just to give you the quick whirlwind tour, first we do some error checking, make sure that some command line arguments were provided, we grab the file name that we want to actually parse and validate from the command line. Uh, uh, we figure out what validator we want to use, which is by definition of this program to be DTD or XSD, uh, and then we process the input. So what do we do? We instantiate a SACS parser factory. Uh, we then do this. So here in this branch is where we actually turn on validation. So if the user via the command line argument has specified that they want DTD validation, you write these lines of code. And you saw this two weeks ago. It's copy pasted from our SACS validator from two weeks ago. So you specifically tell the factory that you want validation on, and what that means is when you spit out a SACS parser, it's going to be a quote unquote validating parser, which simply means that if the XML document has associated with it some DTD, it will be checked for validity against it. And we saw that in uh, use last time. If instead the user wants to do validation by schema, which is implied in this program by this command line argument, you instead do this. You tell the factory to make it namespace aware, you turn on validation, you spit out the parser that you want, and then you set this property. And if you forget, if you ever lose this code, this is actually all taken from Xerces' own, I think, FAQ page or uses page, something like that, where they tell you how to turn on validation. If you're ever using another parser or something other than JAXP, similarly, could you look to that application's uh, manual for how to turn this on, but specifically we set the property called this to this value. So this is just a key value pair. It just so happens the key is really long and the value is pretty long as well. But this is sort of a standard that the world has adopted for specifying what schema language to use and that schema is identified by this unique string. Again, they look like URLs, they're not necessarily URLs, they're unique strings. So that's it. So to turn on schema-based validation using JAXP, you can simply do this. And then else, uh, what do we do? Else validation is off. So if we run this thing, well, we will run this thing. Well, let's run this thing on PO.XML. So I'm going to compile SAX Validator 2. Recall that PO.XML specified with this hint, so to speak, 
no namespace schema location. That is for any nodes without an explicit namespace. In the default namespace, use po.xsd, presumably in the same current working directory. Uh, hopefully this document is valid since it's, it, it is what is in your printouts. So let's go ahead and run sax validator 2 on po.xml using uh, xsd mode because that's all that's relevant tonight. Nothing bad seems to have happened. Well, let's see if it's just not working or it's perfect. So what could we change here to break this? Well, what if we change this to UK, just for kicks, ignoring the city-state uh, inconsistencies? Let's rerun the program. OK, so it's invalid. So one of those uh, parsing warnings, parsing errors, one in the error handler routines was called. And it's pretty, pretty helpful. At least a little more helpful Xerxes is, perhaps, than with DTD. Value UK of attribute country of element ship to. Actually, that's pretty damn specific. <laughs> Um, is not valid with respect to the corresponding attribute use. So that is to say that validation is in fact working and in fact the document was originally quite valid. In an at-home exercise, if you're trying to wrap your mind around some of these things, certainly even play with examples like these. Just try to break something, change something, and see if guess or predict what the parser is going to do. And if the parser behaves as you expect, you probably have your mind wrapped around it pretty well. So to conclude with some examples, here is a bookstore, shall we say, and this is taken from the URL down below if you want to refer to some of these examples online as well. What I did was they had a nice compendium of um, different versions of, a, of schema for the same instance document, which allows us to sort of answer the question, how, how do you write a schema for this document, and really proves the point that there really is no one way. And in each of the five ways that I borrowed from them, you will see different approaches, different syntax, different uh, features of schema highlighted. So this is what we shall assume is a bookstore. It's going to be assumed to be associated with that namespace. And according to this line, it's going to be associated with a file called bookstore.xsd. And anything prefixed with XSI is going to refer to schema, the language which is only used right here. So we've seen that syntax before, and it looks like a bookstore has some number of books, which I've excerpted here. The first book, My Life and My Times, another book down here. And notice again the interesting things, or the candidates for interesting uses of schema are probably, again, things like dates and ISBNs and so forth. So let's take a look at the first of the solutions to the question how might you define a schema for this document? In the bookstore directory of tonight's examples, there's a whole bunch of subdirectories. Um, in each of them, bookstore.xml is just repeated again and again. It pretty much just kept everything together. But in example 01's bookstore.xsd, do we see one solution to this problem? And you have a printout of this too, if you'd like to refer to it or annotate it. Notice that, let's just take a look at the the, root, the first element defined. The first element is called bookstore. It's a complex type, which it better be, because a bookstore has children, which by nature makes it complex. And notice that a bookstore in this first version of the schema is going to be a sequence of the following elements. It's just one element, book. It's, so it's not a named element. It's actually referring to an element. So this, too, is a new feature. We saw the use of ref before with the comment. Now we'll actually tease apart its meaning. What this means is that this is referring to the element called book that's defined elsewhere. So this is, again, another instance of reuse of code. So book can occur one time minimally, any number of times maximally, and it must occur in that order. So it's almost silly to say sequence, because it's a sequence of this element, but you need a content model. So we just chose, he, they chose sequence for this example. And that's it. A bookstore is a sequence of one or more books. But notice, one or more books. It's got to have at least one, apparently. What is a book to which this line is referring to? Well, it's referring to this guy. Okay, so what is a book? A book, too, is of complex type, as you might expect, because it has children. It is a sequence of title, author, date, ISBN, publisher, each of which must occur exactly once, according to the whole min occurs, max occurs sequence there. Okay, um, And notice that these things are actually used as references. So again, they're not being defined inline, though they could be. Again, the, goal, the point here is that you can do this any number of ways. They're defined externally. So what's a title? Eh, string. Author, string. Date, string. ISBN, 
completely punted and just said, eh, they're strings. But what we have at least specified, which is interesting, is that a bookstore has one or more books and that a book has this sequence of children. They didn't go any farther than that to say, you know what, a title really looks like this or an ISBN is structured like that. So this really is version one, sort of as quick and as dirty as you might get with a, at least an interesting schema. Indeed, a good question. So how could we, um, could we revise this thing and actually make it a little trimmer? There's several things we could do. I'll do a couple quickly on the fly. We certainly don't need these guys anymore because those are implied. So we haven't changed the meaning, but we've certainly just elim uh, eliminated a bunch of keystrokes. So I could continue doing that. We don't need to define these things as references. I could instead say, as we did with many of our examples tonight, name author is of type XSD string. And I could define it inline and not do this subsequent reference later in the document. And then that means I could go ahead and delete this author reference. So absolutely, we could chip away at this, save some lines of code, and maybe make it a little more readable because we factored this out to the top level, but it doesn't really gain us anything. Might as well just put it where it belongs in this case. But again, one of the takeaways here is going to be just how can we do better. So let's take a look at example two, which is also called bookstore.xsd, and it looks like the following. So at first glance, definitely looks like some things are different, but we are still using these references, it seems. So a bookstore is a sequence of one or more books, but it's referring to BK colon book now. So at least we're now seeing the notion of uh, prefixes at play here. So what does that mean for us? Well, what's a book? A book is a sequence of these things, which is similarly referring to other definitions, which are now down here. So this begs the question, where is this BK colon coming into play? Well, let's take a look up top. BK colon is defined as books.org, uh, as, as referring to this namespace identifier. Okay, so that's what BK colon implies. So that sort of begs the question, what is the target namespace for all the definitions in here? Hopefully it is the same, the bookstore.org namespace. So again, this example doesn't add anything functionally and arguably it actually makes it a little more confusing, but what it hopefully does, if nothing else, is sort of reinforce the role that these namespaces and prefixes might play. The point being that all of these elements, in that they're defined with these names, and we did say before, if you're going to give things a name, you don't say foo colon name, you just name the thing, but then you specify what namespace these elements belong to. You do that by way of the target namespace attributes. So what that means is that all of these references are simply to the elements that are in that namespace. Well, what, where are the definitions for elements in that namespace? Right there, because of the target namespace attribute. And if you're still a little uncomfortable with these distinctions, don't worry about it. I think we're perhaps showing you more than is necessary. You need the BK colon here because you're referring to elements that are defined in that particular namespace because of, you're using references here. Because the question is, what title are you referring to? What author are you referring to? The author that is defined by the BK colon namespace. That's all. But don't fret too much over some of these details, certainly. And there's no default In this case, there's no default names. Oh, well, there is. It's schema itself, which is why we have no mentions of XSD colon. So that's, that's actually another useful takeaway, especially if you want to eliminate four keystrokes for every element. Conceptually different? No, same rule. Same rule. We just haven't, I mean, frankly, we haven't seen namespaces used much beyond the definitions of tags names. So this is just a more explicit use of the, uh, more explicit evidence of the role that namespace prefixes can play. But conceptually, it's the same idea.
In this case, yes. That's how schema would operate. And again, I, let me propose we forge ahead only because I don't want you to worry so much that tonight's about namespaces. Just realize that it allows us to do certain things that we, might, that we wouldn't be able to without them. Okay, so now we're actually chipping away and the file's getting shorter, a little wider, but just because we've indented, this is version three of the bookstore schema. Again, we have a bookstore. This time we have an anonymous type defined in line, which makes perfect sense because we not, we're not reusing this thing anyway. It's a sequence of books which in turn are defined in line in terms of their type. It's an anonymous complex type that's of this sequence. So this is perhaps, I'm sure you could find ways to chip away at this too, but this is much more succinct than the other versions have been thus far. We've just been eliminating some unnecessary features, but at least features that are probably worth knowing about. And we'll leave it at that. Version 4, and there's only five, so we're near the end of them. Version 4 does this. So now we're defining a schema for the same XML. A bookstore is a complex type whose children are a sequence of one or more books, which in turn are each of type book, book publication. So the only fundamental difference so far seems to be that now we're using a named type. Again, why? Well, it's illustrative. Which one is best is really up to your own goals or personal preferences. These are all functionally equivalent thus far. A book publication type looks like this, and eh, we've seen it before. So really the only difference here is that we are factoring out the data type and giving it an actual name. But functionally, we haven't really done anything too interesting. It's in the fifth example that we'll actually see some additional features of schema, and it's actually next week when we'll go one step further and really show you some of the, the power of schema, so to speak. And here's a teaser of it. So in this case, we're now finally beginning to use data types and restrictions with facets and so forth a little more interestingly. So skip ahead to here to where these things are defined. Title, author, and publisher are still strings. Pretty uninteresting. But date is of type G year which is pretty much just a year, as you might expect. And ISBN, though, is of type ISBN type. That's not a primitive. And we know that because it's not prefixed with XSD colon. So here's another instance of a prefix within a value. But it's of type ISBN type. That's one of their types, our types, for tonight's purposes. It's a simple type, which means it's not going to have children, and it's not going to have attributes. But it's going to be based on the notion of a string. It's going to be a restriction, though. It's not any string. It's a string that looks like that. And that crazy thing is what you're pretty familiar with as a regular expression. And notice it looks crazy long, but notice that there's a couple vertical bars in there, which suggests the OR operator, the union operator, can be any of those formats. So when I mentioned earlier tonight that an ISBN can look like what you saw on the board or a couple different formats, here's what an ISBN might look like, at least so far as this schema expects. And then the rest of the document doesn't add anything functionally. So this fifth version is perhaps the only version of the five that fundamentally changes the definition of the schema, not just in a syntactic way, but rather in a functional way, in a neat way. And we'll see more tricks like this next week. So Scamazon. So this is the last of the projects, believe it or not. So after Scamazon, for which you have the typical three weeks, there is a uh, four week period pretty much till the end of the semester during which you would be working on your own projects of your own design. So per the syllabus and the website, the proposal for the final project is due next week. Um, pragmatically, you wouldn't really be expected to or really need to, is the idea, start working on the projects until after you turn in Scamazon. So the idea of the proposal being, uh, being due early is meant to get you thinking certainly early, work out any problems or have time to work out any problems that you can hit the ground running when you turn this thing in. Because I'm sure the first thing y'all do on uh, either Wednesdays at 12.31 or maybe Thursday mornings is start on the next project. So here's our picture of what Scamazon is all about. Long story short, Scamazon is, a, uh, is to be an e-commerce type website. So project three was about a portal and allowed you to incorporate some related features there too. Scamazon is about doing something in the realm of e-commerce, some ideas of which will hopefully be applicable to your lives outside of this class, things like shopping cart, checking out, uh, generating uh, PDFs, 
uh, using web services, we'll use those as well. So what is Scamazon? It's a website that allows a user to browse a catalog of products, which happen to have a sports spin this time. So you'll have a whole bunch of GIFs and JPEGs of baseball bats and baseball gloves and stuff like that, all of which have prices. And the user is going to be allowed to browse this catalog via some interface like Amazon's, but not for books. They need to be able to click on items which have different subtypes. So like a jersey comes in small, medium, large, and so forth. And they've got to be able to click a link and add something to their shopping cart, add some more stuff to their shopping cart, delete things from their shopping cart, and so forth. Very traditional e-commerce stuff. They've got to be able ultimately to click a button and actually check out. What that ultimately is going to mean, and we'll define what a web service is in two weeks' time, is they will be the act of clicking check out will cause your application to submit a purchase order in the form of an XML document to what's called a web service, which in spirit is going to be a warehouse that simply receives your XML file, parses it, checks its own database of inventory to see if the baseball bats you ordered are in stock, and then it returns to you a POAC document, an element called POAC, inside of which is all the relevant details as to which parts or part of the order was fulfilled, and then your Scamazon.com interface would present the user with a receipt saying, yes, this was ordered, or no, these items were back ordered. So it pretty much is just an e-commerce engine in a traditional sense. And some of the neat things we'll be doing in, again, two weeks' time is exploding this box here and talking about what is a web service. And what you'll be using to transmit this data from here to here is actually going to be something called SOAP. So this is um, a protocol that's becoming popular along with others for these sort of seamless uh, interfaces, RPC-like interfaces between two different sites or two different servers. Um, needless to say, there's going to be some XML, some XSL, but the spec will walk you through exactly what those various files are all about. What we'll do in section tonight, which we'll start early, I think, tonight in this room and then move to the other room if need be, is do our typical code walkthrough. Um, XSD schema does appear throughout the project, but what we use it for largely, as I was hinting at before, is not so much for constant validation of data, because you're writing the application, presumably you know what your own data formats look like, but we use it really for specifications and actually specifying what your PO element's going to look like, what the PO act element's going to look like. So with that said, you have pretty much all of the, so far as the course is concerned, the background material with which to dive into this project as of tomorrow, Thursday morning. And if you're a little uncomfortable with any of the mentions of schema, for the most part, you can ignore those. And I'll make that more clear as we walk through the PDF tonight. Anything relating to, though, this web service, you can quite justifiably just ignore for two weeks. Since the idea of SOAP and web services and WSDL, um, you can certainly tackle it now if you wish, but know that more information on that is coming. Any questions? What we'll do next week then again is offer a bit more detail on schema and some of the features thereof, but a bit more time on project four. But otherwise, in the meantime, why don't we officially adjourn here? If you'd like to depart, please do. Otherwise, in a minute or so, I'll launch into a section chat and code walkthrough.